Good afternoon. Uh, I've been reading uh, various excerpts from the Seven Pillars of Wisdom just to demonstrate how wonderfully this book is written and to um, maybe give you some incentive to read it. Um, and I've just been picking excerpts sort of randomly. So uh, today I'm on page 253 of this version, a uh, version that has a picture of T.E. Lawrence on the cover. And <clears throat> I won't be responding to comments on chat until the end if you have any. Um, but what I want to do is uh, read this straight through and then I will uh, come back. So this passage is about the importance of the city of Dera. Now, that city was the city in which, in the movie Lawrence of Arabia, Lawrence was tortured by the Turkish colonel in charge of, of Dera. And so this will tell you something about that. It'll tell you something about uh, the British Army at that time. And keep in mind that at this point in the war, T.E. Lawrence was a first lieutenant in the British Army, uh, officially. So, um, or perhaps... Perhaps by this time he had been field promoted to major, but he had not yet uh, actually put the rank on his shoulders. So I'm reading uh, from chapter 69, page 253, October 1917, accordingly was a month of anticipation for us in the knowledge that Allenby, with Bowles and Downey, was planning to attack the gaza Beersheba line, while the Turks, a quite small army strongly entrenched with ex excellent lateral communications, had been puffed up by successful victories uh, to imagine that all British generals were incompetent to keep what their troops had won for them by dint of sheer hard fighting. They, de <clears throat> they deceived themselves. Allenby's coming had remade the English. His breadth of personality swept away the mist of private or de departmental jealousies behind which Murray and his men had worked. <clears throat> General Lyndon Bell behind which Murray and his men had worked. Lyndon, uh, General Lyndon Bell made way for General Bowles, Allenby's chief of staff in France, a little, quick, brave, pleasant man, a tactical soldier perhaps, but principally an admirable and effaced foil to Allenby, who used to relax himself on Bowles. Unfortunately, neither of them had the power of choosing men but Chetwood's judgment completed them with Guy Downey at, as third member of the staff. Bowles was never an opinion nor any knowledge. Bowles, <clears throat> I guess we're going to have to uh, resort to my patch again. This is a, an affliction of getting old. Uh, it's nothing that all that serious, but it does complicate my reading on occasion because I'm seeing double in the horizontal, which means that I see two lines of type. So excuse me for while I wear my patch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's what's been messing up my reading. 
Bowles never had an opinion nor any knowledge. Downey was mainly intellect. He lacked the eagerness of Bowles and the calm drive and human understanding of Allenby, who was the man the men worked for, the image we worshipped. Downey's cold, shy mind gazed upon our efforts with bleak eye. <clears throat> Always thinking, thinking. Beneath this mathematical surface, he hid passionate, many-sided convictions, a reasoned scholarship in higher warfare, and the brilliant bitterness of a judgment disappointed with us and with life. He was the least professional of soldiers, a banker who read Greek history, a strategist unashamed and a burning poet with strength over daily things. <clears throat> During the war, he had had the grief of planning the attack at Suvla, spoiled by incompetent tacticians and the battle for Gaza. As each work of his was ruined by with as each work of his was ruined, he withdrew further into the hardnesses of frosted pride, for he was the stuff of fanatics. Allenby, by not seeing his dissatisfaction, broke into him, and Downey replied by giving, by giving for the Jerusalem advance all the talent which he abundantly possessed. A cordial union of two such men made the Turks' position hopeless from the outset. Their divergent characters were mirrored in the intricate plan. Gaza had been entrenched on a European scale with line after line of defenses in, rever in reserve. It was, no, it, it was so obviously the enemy's strongest point that the British higher command had twice chosen it for frontal attack. Allenby, fresh from France, insisted that any further assault must be delivered by an overwhelming numbers of men and guns and their trust maintained by enormous quantities of all kinds of transport. Bowles nodded his assent. Downey was not the man to fight a straight battle. He sought to destroy the enemy's strength with the least fuss. Like a master politician, he used the bluff chief as a cloak for the last depths of justifiable slimness. He advised a drive at far at he advised a drive at the far end of the Turkish line near Beersheba. To make his victory cheap. <clears throat> To make his victory cheap, he wanted the enemy main force behind Gaza, which would be best secured if the British concentration was hidden so that the Turks would believe the flank attack to be a shallow feint. Bowles nodded his assent. Consequently, the movements were made in great secrecy, but Downey found an ally in his intelligence staff who advised him to go beyond negative precautions and to give the enemy specific and speciously wrong information of the plans he matured. His ally was Meinertshagen. His ally was Meinertshagen, a student of migrating birds drifted into soldiering, whose hot immoral hatred of the enemy expressed itself as read, readily in trickery as in violence. He persuaded Downey, Allenby reluctantly agreed. Bowles assented and the work began. Meinertshagen knew no half measures. He was a logical, he was logical and idealist of the deepest and so pet and so possessed of his convictions that he was willing to harness evil to the chariot of good. He was a strategist, a geographer, and a silent, laughing, masterful man who took, a blithe, who took as blithe a pleasure in deceiving his enemy or his friend by some unscrupulous jest. 
as in spattering the brains of a cornered mob of Germans one by one with his Af African knob carry. His instincts were abetted by an immensely powerful body and a savage brain, which shows the best way to its purpose, unhampered by doubt or habit. Minor thought, minor thought out false army papers, elaborate and confidential, which to a trained staff officer would indicate wrong positions for Allenby's main, for, main formation wrong direction of the coming attack and a date some days too late. This information was led up to by careful hints given in code wireless messages. When he knew the enemy had picked, when he knew the enemy had picked these up, Meinertagen rode out with his notebooks on reconnaissance. He pushed forward until the enemy saw him. In the ensuing gallop, he lost all his loose equipment and very nearly himself, but was rewarded by seeing the enemy reserves held behind Gaza and their whole preparations swung toward the coast and made less urgent. Simultaneously, an army order by Ali Faud Pasha cautioned his staff against carrying documents into the line. <clears throat> We on the Arab front were very intimate with the enemy. Our Arab officers had been Turkish officers and knew every leader on the other side personally. They had suffered the same training, thought the same, took the same point of view. By practicing modes of approach upon the Arabs, we could explore the Turks, understand, also get inside their minds. Relation between us and them was universal for the civil population of the enemy area was wholly ours without pay or persuasion. In consequence, our intelligence service was the widest, fullest, and most certain imaginable. <clears throat> we knew better than Allenby, the enemy hollowness and the magnitude of the British resources. We underestimated the crippling effect of Allenby's too plentiful artillery and the, cumbrous and the cumbrous intricacy of his infantry and cavalry. And the cumbrous intricacy of his infantry and cavalry, which moved only with rheumatic slowness. He hoped Allenby would be given a month's fine weather we hoped Allenby would give it, be given a month's fine weather and in that case expected to see him take not merely Jerusalem, but Haifa too, sweeping the Turks in ruin through the hills. Such would be our moment and we needed to be ready for it on the spot where our weight and tactic would be least expected and most damaging. For my eyes, the center of attraction was dead off the junction of the Jerusalem, Haifa, Damascus, Medina railways, the naval of the Turkish armies in Syria, the common point of all their fronts, and by chance an area in which lay great untouched reserves of Arab fighting men, educated and armed by Faisal from Aqaba. We could, we could there use and these are tribal names, Ruala, Sarahin, Serdeya, Horatia, and far stronger than tribes, the settled peoples of Horan and Jebel Druze. I pondered for a while whether we should not call up all these adherents and tackle the Turkish communications in force. We were certain with any management of 12,000 men, enough to rush Dara, to smash all the railway lines, even to take Damascus by surprise. Any one of these things would make the position of the Beersheba army critical and my temptation to stake our capital instantly upon the issue was very sore. 
Not for the first or last time, service to two masters irked me. I was one of Allenby's officers and in his confidence. In return, he expected me to do the best I could for him. I was Faisal's advisor, and Faisal relied upon the honesty and competence of my advice so far as often to take it without argument. Yet I could not explain to Allenby the whole Arab situation, nor disclose the full British plan to Faisal. The local people were imploring us to come. Sheikh Talal el Haraidim, leader of the hollow country about Dera, sent in repeated messages that, with a few of our riders as proof of Arab support, we would, he would give us Dera. Such an exploit would have done the Allenby business, but was not one which Faisal could scrupulously afford unless he had a fair hope of then establishing himself there. Dera's sudden capture, followed by a retreat, would have involved the massacre or the ruin of all the splendid pe peasantry of the district. They could only rise once, and their effort on that occasion must be decisive. To call them out now was to risk the best asset Faisal held for eventual success. On the speculation that Allenby's first attack would sweep the enemy before it, and that the month of November would be rainless, favorable to a rapid advance. I weighed the English army in my mind and could not honestly assure myself of them. The men were often gallant fighters, but their generals as often gave away in stupidity what they had gained in ignorance. Allenby was quite untried, sent to us with a not blameless record from France and his troops had broken down in and been broken by the Murray period. Of course, we were fighting for an allied victory, and since the English were the leading partners, the Arabs would, the Arabs would have in the last resort to be sacrificed for them. But was it the last resort? The war generally was going neither well nor very ill, and it seemed as though there might be time for another try next year. So I decided to postpone the hazard for the Arabs' sake. And so that was the introduction of Dera to, uh, to the thinking of T. E. Lawrence and his decision to postpone uh, the attack until uh, 1918. Uh, and as it happens, the final scenes of Lawrence Arabia, uh, of Arabia are taking place in late October of 1918, which obviously was uh, just before uh, the armistice that ended World War I, which occurred on at the 11th hour and the 11th minute of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918, uh, November 11, 1918. Uh, so anyway, that is my reading for today. Uh, I'll come back with a more interesting uh, reading uh, tomorrow. And that reading is about the only traitor that uh, the Arab cause had uh, during during T.E. Lawrence's time with them. And um, he appears throughout several of the last chapters of the book. And so I will introduce him in my reading tomorrow. And so thank you for joining me today. Hello, Mario. Uh, see you again sometime soon. <laughs>